Hi, I'm Carmen Baskoff here with Lydia Brown. We're the producers of Where We Live, and we're taking a few moments out of your podcast uh, just to ask you to uh, think about um, making a donation to continue allowing us to produce Where We Live and uh, bring it to you every day. Uh, the number to donate is 1-800-584-2788, or you can go online to wnpr.org slash donate. Think about the content that you hear on this station and specifically on this program, where each day we work hard to keep you connected to your community, to the issues that matter most to the people in your backyard. If that is something that you value, we hope you'll support it today. It's quick, it's easy, and it's secure, and it's so appreciated by us. one 800 584-2788 or online at wnpr.org and thank you. You're about to hear a rebroadcast of Where We Live and originally aired October 19th, 2019. This is where we live. From Connecticut Public Radio, I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Your bedroom is the perfect place to seek refuge after a long day. Some of us pay quite a bit of money for the perfect mattress and luxurious sheets. And nothing beats burying yourself under a soft duvet. Don't forget the blackout curtains to completely block out life stresses and distractions. Author Brian Fagan says we spend one third of our lives in bed. Yet our beds are, quote, humanity's most overlooked artifact. Fagan's new book chronicles the social history of the bed over the last 70,000 years. It's called What We Did in Bed, A Horizontal History. And today where we live, he joins us to talk about the book that he co-authored with Nadia Durrani. Coming up, we'll learn about how the bed went from a communal to private experience. And we'll hear stories about how influential people like Louis XIV to Mark Twain viewed their beloved beds. Uh, Brian Fagan is Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And as I mentioned, uh, he's co-author of the book, What We Did in Bed. Brian's joining us via Skype today. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for getting me out of bed. It's such an ungodly (laughs) hour. Well, we appreciate you being a good sport joining us from California at this early hour. Uh, So first off, uh, we talk a lot about history on uh, the show, but I don't think any of us really thought about the history of the bed until your book uh, showed up in our newsroom. What prompted you to write about it? Well, as a matter of fact, it really started in a weird way. I was contacted by a man whom I'd known at university who runs a management consulting company in Montreal. And Montreal, of course, is a long way from California. And he asked me if I knew anything about beds, and I said absolutely nothing. It turned out that he and his company were involved in the merging of two mattress companies. And would I come to Atlanta and give a talk on the history of beds? So I agreed to do it, and in the middle of my visit, I happened to talk to my editor at Yale University Press, and he said, why don't you write a history of beds? And he, I said to him, you're crazy, and the out- outcome was that I pulled in my good friend and co-author Nadia Durrani, and we wrote this history of beds, which turned out to be a fascinating and extremely challenging job. But we succeeded, and we're (laughs) actually very thrilled it's out. Well, it's actually a very interesting read as well. You did a good job, uh, Brian, with your co-author, Nadia. Do you know, is this the the only book out there talking about the history of, of beds? There are a few others, but most of them are focusing on the period after Louis XIV. There's one book which does an excellent job of Queen Elizabeth II, but most of the material is European. There is, of course, a huge literature on sleep, a huge literature on childbirth, but we are fairly unique and certainly unique in that we've written a global history of beds because we go on examples from China and all over the place. It's a short book, but we kind of cover a lot of different aspects of the bed. You mentioned it was very challenging. So so tell us how you traveled uh, back uh, through uh, history, uh, looking at the social history of beds. You know, how far back did you go, and what did you find in terms of uh, the beds of our ancestors? 
Well, we did know when we started, and this was a very challenging piece of research. It involved extensive reading and extensive use of the web, which turned out to be a remarkable source. And of course, a lot of talking to different people. But we ended up going back 77,000 years to our astonishment, because in South Africa, at a cave called Sibudu, they have discovered hollows in the ground, which the people of the day, they were modern humans, dug into the subsoil and filled with a type of grass. But this grass is a little unusual in that it's insect repelling. So they clearly knew something about what you might loosely call bed bugs as long ago as that. And people slept in hollows in the ground in caves for tens of thousands of years before, of course, they had slept in the trees. So this was a very interesting baseline. And people have found traces of such beds among the Neanderthals, for example. So it's a pretty basic form of sleeping, but it can be called a bed. What factor led uh, early humans uh, to venture from the trees into caves and then even to sleep on the ground, Brian? Oh, I think a lot of it was connected with uh, better defense against predators, better mobility. Uh, fire had a huge impact because fires are a good way of deterring predators. So uh, it was really a whole combination of things, uh, cooking and so on. Brian Fagan is co-author of the book, What We Did in Bed. That's what we're focusing on here on Where We Live Today. He's joining us via Skype from California. Uh, when we I, I started the show talking about how our uh, beds are in uh, private bedrooms, an oasis uh, for many of us after a long day. But when we look back through time, uh, was sleep as private as uh, we have it now? No, it was not. Uh, one of the undercurrents of this book is in fact, which is more, it's more an exploration of beds as a human phenomenon than it is a sort of century by century history. One of the things that came out as a, a fairly consistent theme is the whole issue of changing attitudes among humans to privacy. Privacy in the sense that we practice it today with sealed off bedrooms and so on. Uh, and great concern legitimately with our personal privacy, with the web and so on, really is a fairly recent phenomenon. The earliest real practices of privacy really were among people like Romans and prom prominent Greeks and so on, who did began to have uh, individual sleeping places but it really didn't become extremely common until the 18th and 19th centuries. I mean, Samuel Pepys, the diarist, had all sorts of people sleeping in his bedroom on and off, male and female. So uh, the whole issue of privacy, who you sleep with, was a very persistent part of this history. And when they were sleeping, whether it was with uh, strangers, it wasn't necessarily uh, sexual. This was they were just sharing their bed because that's what people did. Oh, yes, absolutely. It was uh, to use that the, the modern expression. It was platonic. Very much so. Uh, a lot of people slept in beds when they stayed in inns, they just slept with complete strangers, male and female. Nobody thought much of it, or if anything. The Chinese have the, the Kang, which is a platform that you sleep on, and the people commonly slept together on that. I believe this also does still happen in northern China, although we were unable to verify this. So it, it sleeping with other people is very commonplace. The most famous example of commonal sleeping is a remarkable bed called the Great Bed of Ware. And Ware was a town in central England. And way back, about the 17th century or even earlier, a innkeeper there commissioned a huge bed, a four-poster bed, which became a popular tourist attraction. In fact, uh, there was an apocryphal story that 26 butchers 
and their wives, and I'm quoting here, frolicked in this bed overnight. Of course, the bed is too small for that, but it's a lovely story. And that bed, which you can see in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, uh, well, it's a very popular exhibit, uh, was a much sought after tourist attraction for centuries. So sleeping with people has been an interesting topic uh, in the history of beds. Wait, describe the Great Bed of Ware. Uh, you said it was a, a huge four-poster bed. Uh, but exactly when we look at a, maybe a, a, a double or king bed that we have today, was it a couple of those together? Oh, I would say it was a monster <laughs> a king-sized bed, basically. It's not as big as uh, the stories tell you. Uh, I can't offhand give you the exact dimensions, mm -hmm. but it takes up a great deal of space in a room. Uh, I would say it's probably maybe a third bigger than the average king size bed of today, which of course in those days was sensational because beds then tended to be much smaller. Many people in Europe slept in uh, what you might call closet beds in the side of rooms and so on. So it was pretty sensational in its day, and it was beautifully built, uh, made, I believe, by a Belgian craftsman. It absolutely gorgeous. Um, and if you go to the Victoria and Albert Museum, and if you haven't been there, you, uh, you go to England, go and see not only the museum, which is fabulous, but the Great Bed of Ware. I'm making note of this myself. <laughs> uh, before we head to break, uh, Brian Fagan again, uh, co-author of the book What We Did in Bed. You know, we think about uh, medieval times and earlier this idea of people sharing beds. What about also sharing disease or maybe even uh, certain uh, bugs like lice? So, uh, did, when did that become a concern? Uh, bugs. Like lice, when did, yeah. Oh, when people when people realize, well, you know, we can we can share a bed, but then this idea of sharing oh, disease as well. This is um, something which is much more modern. The well sort of concern with hygiene and beds and so on is much more modern. Uh, really, you get a huge preoccupation with it in Victorian times when the private bedroom came in. And there were enormous descriptions, lengthy descriptions in books on how to furnish your bedroom and your house written for young brides, which was a flourishing genre in Victorian times about how to make and clean your bed at least once a, once a week, once a month. And it was considered a major task for domestic servants to shake them out and get rid of soot and bugs. Uh, there's long been a concern. Uh, when people slept in medieval halls and so on, there were bugs all over the place. But the people then were much more tolerant of that sort of thing than they are today, as they, of course, almost universally suffered from parasites and so on. So it's a very modern thing. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. My guest today, Brian Fagan, Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, co-author of a really interesting book called What We Did in Bed, A Horizontal History. He's joining us via Skype today. Coming up, we're going to talk more about the role beds play in the lives of humans from birth to death. And when did it become popular to have private bedrooms when our ancestors shared beds with not only family members, but strangers, too? We'll find out more and you can join us. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. I like your bed. It's more comfortable than mine. You got a lot of pillows. I can tell of the expensive kind. You keep your bed Hi, I'm Lydia Brown here with Carmen Baskoff. We're the producers of Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio, and we want to thank you for taking the time to listen to the Where We Live podcast. Uh, we're taking a moment also to ask you to support the work that we do on this program to ensure that it is here for weeks and months and years to come. It's quick, it's easy, and it's secure. All you have to do is go to the phones 1-800-584-2788 or go online to wnpr.org. 
I think one of the tricky things about a, a live radio show is uh, we're, we are only in one time block, and that might not be a time you're able to listen. So that's the, the great part of the podcast. You can take Where We Live with you wherever you're going at whatever time. So if that's something that's important to you, something you rely on to learn about what's happening in your community and in the world, the number to call 1-800-584-2788, or you can go online to wnpr.org slash donate. And thanks. You're about to hear a rebroadcast of Where We Live. That originally aired October 19th, 2019. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We often reflect back on historical events and people on the show, and today we're bringing you another one of those conversations, but it's focused on a topic you may not have thought much about until today, and that's the bed. My guest is Brian Fagan, Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, co-author of What We Did in Bed, A Horizontal History. He joins us today via Skype. You can join us too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, Brian, uh, earlier you mentioned uh, during the Victorian time is when uh, you started to see people uh, move away from co-sleeping. Was that mostly people of of, um, wealth that were looking... uh, to have privacy because they could afford to do so. Yeah, one of the fascinating things about the history of beds is really how very little we know. There is a huge amount of research that needs doing. But one of the most striking things about it is that, as far as we could tell, the real history of the bedroom goes back to not so much privacy, but protection for monarchs and prominent people. For example, Queen Elizabeth II really uh, was sealed off. She had all kinds of different rooms around her, and her bedroom was really only visited by herself and her intimate servants, who were women. So she was really sealed off. When you get to uh, King Louis XIV of France, His bedroom was a platform, really, for governing the country and there were elaborate ceremonies when he got up in the morning and when he went to bed. And to witness his getting up in the morning was a major privilege and a sign of favor if you were allowed in. And there were often dozens of people who stood and watched as he got dressed and so on. He lived in public. He really did. Uh, Privacy really only came at night, and even then there were people around largely to protect him. And his valet was always there, or one of his servants. In Victorian times, when people increasingly slept in separate bedrooms, then of course the whole rules of privacy changed. Your bedroom became a refuge, a place where you sealed yourself off, and Houses began to have multiple bedrooms for for children, for relatives, for in-laws, mothers, and so on. But there is, as I said earlier, this vast literature of how to furnish your bedroom, some of which by modern standards is hilariously funny, and some of which is perfectly good today. The big concern with a lot of Victorian bedrooms was cleanliness with all the soot in the air and so on. But there are recommendations, for example, that beds, bedrooms have a long couch where the female of the house, the wife of the house, the house my wife, could sit back, recline, and recover from the pressures surrounding her during the day, which were formidable. I mean, you really were a very busy person if you were a Victorian wife <laughs> at home. So... Uh, that was a major factor. And you've got lovely things like telling men not to use pens in the bedroom because they spill ink and so on. It really was a place that you spent time alone and it was quiet because one of the things about Victor medieval bedrooms was, or sleeping places, that many of them were communal houses and it was noisy and animals were born there in and out and so on. So Victorian bedrooms really were an art form. And of course, today, they really are an art form. Mm. Uh, We got a tweet from a listener, Dan, uh, who writes, The comfort of my bed has seemed to fluctuate based on my economic stability. My favorite place to sleep remains on a big, comfy couch. My father was a fireman who spent nights at work. He's retired now, but still prefers to sleep in a lazy boy chair with the TV on. 
That's fascinating. One of the things about sleeping is that people are perfectly comfortable in all kinds of situations. And in many cases, uh, like the firemen, uh, they are used to sleeping in chairs and they do it as a matter of course. They don't even think about it. There was a fascinating study done in the 1940s by an anthropologist who lived in Northeast Africa. And he was taught by the people he lived among to sleep on the ground, taking care to make sure that bugs and insects didn't attack his penis. So there was an art, and he reported that it, it was a perfectly comfortable way to sleep once you figured out how to position yourself. And you find this, for example, with prisoners of war, many of whom came back and were more comfortable at first sleeping on the floor. You found this also with uh, sailors in, in yachts. Many of them have trouble at first or used to adjusting back to comfortable double beds after sleeping in hard bunks. So it's a, it's a common phenomenon that you get used to sleeping a certain way and you sleep there. But the popular litany today, of course, is the bed is a refuge, it's a place must, where you must be comfortable. So it really is a um, interesting uh, concept. And the, the person who called in or wrote in is absolutely correct. There are all sorts of ways of sleeping. Oh, you know, we think about the bed as well as the focal point of of uh, events uh, in our life, whether it's uh, conception uh, to birth uh, to death. And uh, you write about how uh, nowadays uh, when women are uh, laboring, especially in Western countries, the idea is to lay in a hospital uh, bed and deliver a child. But that wasn't always the case. No, it was not. Um, this is very, actually, uh, and Nadia really wrote that part of the book. That's her game. Um, she has a son. The idea of a hospital bed as a place to sleep is relatively modern and in fact was the subject in the 19th century uh, of, of considerable controversy among physicians among others. Uh, the issue of course is hygiene. Uh, you probably today are pretty comfortable having a bed, a baby at home because hygiene is of a very high standard but it's really the highest standard at least in theory, in hospitals. And that's where people now tend to be born, simply because of the dangers of complications and so on. But, oh yeah, it was very common to bring in a midwife into your house or even to give birth, and Africans used to do this on them, in a field. You would squat down and have your baby uh, while working in the fields. There were all sorts of ways people gave birth. There were epic descriptions of giving birth in the 18th and 17th centuries, which are not pleasant to read because uh, the mother suffered. And of course, the number of women who died in childbirth was much higher. But there was definitely a move towards giving birth in hospital in the 19th and certainly the 20th century. We just have a couple minutes before our next break, uh, Brian, but I did want to talk about uh, the uh, the idea of a deathbed, uh, even uh, when we think about the way coffins are designed today to say goodbye to loved ones. Uh, talk a little bit about how our ancestors uh, displayed uh, the dead in such a way that it looked like they were resting in the afterlife. There is this big thing about deathbeds, and you do if you read obituaries, or almost invariably, it's almost a cliche now that so-and-so died surrounded by his loved ones or her loved ones, or in the presence of his family and so on. And this has become a sort of scenario. Back in the 19th century, or 18th century certainly, deathbeds were, for prominent people, really major events. You've got, for example, Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria's Beth deathbed was quite a scene. And in fact, after she died, it was, the death was drawn in pictures and so on. You find the same of the preacher John Wesley, for example. He died surrounded by grieving priests and his relatives. 
So this has been common. It is a phenomenon which goes way back, um, but it's not something that's that well documented when you go further further into history. The, the real thing about people dying is that it's closure and it's a way of saying goodbye. And of course, with religious undertones of going on your way to eternity, uh, you have another aspect of this too. And that is the whole issue of royal succession. For example, go back to the days of ancient Egypt, where the pharaoh ruled in a country and with a, a court which was absolutely riddled with factionalism. And the reason it was riddled with factionalism and many early courts were very simple, because death came to everybody and death came to many people suddenly without warning in eras when medical care, to put it mildly, was pretty basic. And literally a pharaoh could be like Tutankhamun, who was not in good health in his teens. And he could die suddenly. And there was a constant quiet battle going on between ambitious relatives as to who would take over. And some pharaohs and others, uh, Chinese emperors, for example, Indian emperors, took elaborate precautions as they were dying to make sure who their, their successors were, which didn't always work. So it's a very, very complex situation in our lives. It's become much more ordered. It's part of like hospice. It's part of the process of death. Uh, when I die, I hope I am not surrounded by the family. I'm not interested in that sort of goodbye, but a lot of people are, and it's fair enough. Brian Fagan is my guest today. Uh, he's co-author of the book, What We Did in Bed, A Horizontal History. We, we talk about uh, the social history of the bed. Uh, coming up, we're going to talk more about uh, how the single bedroom became popularized. And we're going to learn more about uh, Mark Twain's relationship with his bed. Uh, I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. This is where we live. Brian Fagan is also Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, who's joining us today via Skype. Uh, before we continue our conversation after the break, I just want to remind our listeners it's WNPR's fundraising campaign. And if you appreciate the wide variety of conversations and topics on where we live, please support the program. Here are two of my colleagues to tell you more. You're about to hear a rebroadcast of Where We Live that originally aired October 19th, 2019. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Now, today we're talking about the social history of beds. My guest via Skype is Brian Fagan, Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and co-author of the book, What We Did in Bed, A Horizontal History. Uh, Brian, earlier we were uh, hearing you talk about how uh, bedrooms became more private uh, during the Victorian times, and uh, it was common for people to not be sleeping sleeping with strangers at that point if they had the means. Uh, but over time, uh, as we talk more about our bedrooms becoming an oasis and a private experience, when did that really start to take off uh, for us? Was it after the Industrial Age? Uh, it was during, and I, sorry, I think of what, it was probably just before, I think, uh, it really started with the development of the city, the move to suburbs, and the whole notion of family home ownership uh, in places like London and Manchester and so on. And of course, in the United States, too. It's been an extremely pervasive thing, urbanization, to the point that it still occurs today where now people are living in smaller and smaller spaces as the price of property goes up <clears throat> and you get different types of bed, like the, the famous Murphy bed, which folds into the wall, becoming more and more prevalent and a lot more attention is being paid by bed and mattress manufacturers to that segment of the market. You mentioned the Murphy bed. In your book, uh, there were a, a few mishaps with the Murphy bed. Can you tell us about that? Oh, yes, indeed. The most famous one, of course, is in a James Bond movie where James Bond is, of course, collapsed into a Murphy bed and is killed, allegedly. But, of course, he survives. 
Um, and there have been cases of um, people getting trapped in them and actually being suffocated. So, um, but that was the early beds. Today's beds are much more reliable. They are a very comfortable way of sleeping. Actually, I've actually slept in one and it was uh, most pleasant. So today's Murphy beds are a very nice modern thing. The earlier ones, of course, were much simpler. Mm. Uh, at a time there were, uh, it was common for couples to sleep in separate bedrooms. So when was it, uh, I guess, uh, acceptable for couples to share a bedroom and share the same bed and not have the, you know, maybe our grandparents might have had a uh, bed side by side? Uh, this is, of course, uh, still a debate that goes on. Uh, the Queen and <clears throat> Prince Philip uh, to sleep in separate bedrooms, actually, I believe. Um, it's quite common among uh, aristocratic royalty, or was. Uh, today, uh, sleeping together is almost universal, and it really came in in a big way in the 20th century, uh, partially in the 19th. You get into this these dreadful, priggish sort of 19th century attitudes about privacy and sex, and there was an article in Architect magazine way back in, I think, the 1870s, if I recall, which said that beds were definitely places where you slept. And that was it. So there's a long, long debate about this. But I would say that the double bed of today is very much a phenomenon of recent times. Uh, we are lucky here in Hartford, Connecticut, to have the Mark Twain House and Museum, and we wanted to learn more about Mark Twain's relationship with his bed. So joining us uh, by phone now is Jennifer LaRue, Director of Marketing and Public Relations and Director of Writing Programs at the Mark Twain House and Museum. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Uh, so we understand Twain was fond of his bed. Can you describe uh, when visitors come uh, what Mark Twain's bed looked like? Well, yes, and he did love his bed, and he famously uh, arranged a, a photo shoot of himself doing things in his bed, reading and, and writing and um, smoking. And the very bed that, that he loves so much is um, on view on the house tour on the second floor in the master bedroom. And I would like to add that Sam and Livy Clemens did share a bed. So they both enjoyed this Venetian bed that they bought on a trip to Europe, and they spent an exorbitant amount of money on it, $200, which is about $4,600 in today's um, money. And it was this ornately carved um, walnut bed with these uh, cupids or angels on the four bedposts. And they thought they had got this, well, they kind of got swindled into thinking that they were buying this um, rare antique. And come to find out it wasn't all that rare or all that antique, but they loved it nonetheless. And if you believe the Twain legend, um, the reason when you come to see the bed uh, that they have the pillows on the footboard rather than the headboard is that they like to be able to see the carving that they had paid so much money for. More practical people would understand also that it's probably a lot more comfortable to have the pillows against the footboard, which was not as elaborately carved. But in any case, um, uh, he loved his bed. And um, I can read a little quote for you. Uh, he said, it was the most comfortable bedstead that ever was with space enough in it for a family and carved angels enough surmounting its twisted columns and its headboard and footboard to bring peace to the sleepers and pleasant dreams. Uh, and another thing about the bed that people love are those uh, angels on the, the four bedposts. And the little girls, um, Susie, Clara, and Jean Clemens, were allowed to remove them and carry them around like baby dolls. And so they would bathe them and dress them and um, have fun with them all day. But the rule was they had to be back on their bedposts by bedtime. Mm -hmm. So when people come through uh, the House and Museum, what are the reactions to Samuel Clemens' bed? People love it. I mean, they're, they're of course, uh, amused and um, perplexed by the positioning of the pillows that we just talked about. Um, and, it, you know, it's quite an imposing piece of furniture. And uh, it gives people a glimpse, as much as the house tour does, into the really intimate personal life of Sam Clemens or Mark Twain. Um, so it really is a kind of showstopper. Um, and, of course, as with all um, beds of that period, people look at the mattress and say, oh, that mattress is so tiny. It's really not any smaller than, than ours are 
now, but um, there's, it's kind of an optical illusion. There's a really interesting picture uh, from the Mark Twain House of Museum of Mark Twain uh, reading in bed. You mentioned that he would smoke and write. Uh, I'm curious, uh, with smoking, was that uh, something that was dangerous during that time in bed? <laughs> <laughs> it's always been dangerous to smoke in bed. Um, but in, in uh, Mark Twain's case, it was even more dangerous because, of course, the house was entirely lit by gaslight. And there's a lighting fixture in the master bedroom, again, lit by, fueled by gas. And to to accommodate a bedside reading lamp, Mark Twain had a tube um, feeding gas to that bedside lamp. And so there's gas traveling to this lamp that's right by him, and he did like to smoke in bed. So it's really lucky that there was never a conflagration. <laughs> well, Jennifer LaRue, again, is Director of Marketing and Public Relations and Director of Writing Programs at the Mark Twain House and Museum, Museum, joining us by phone today. Jennifer, thank you for telling us a little bit about uh, Mark Twain's relationship with his bed. Well, I hope everybody will come see it in person now. Well, thank you, Jennifer. I wanted to go back to my guest, Brian Fagan, who's co-author of the book, What We Did in Bed, A Horizontal History. Uh, What do you think of uh, that uh, story about Mark Twain's relationship with his bed, Brian? It's it's fascinating. His relationship was one of constant use. It was such a part of his life that it was emotionally important. He wrote a lot of his material in bed in his later life, I believe. And this sort of relationship with a bed highlights what we found in the history of beds, is that beds are far more than mere sleeping platforms where you conceive children and give birth and die. They were places where people had conversations. They were people today, of course, play video games and a link to the web and so on. They really were places where one multitasked. And as she was still going, I was thinking of how Mark Twain really was multitasking. So he was using his bed to the full, which is really cool. And it's nice to, to hear that he really appreciated it. Uh, my bed is one of my favorite places. I, I'm always very comfortable there and thoroughly enjoy it. And one of the things about a bed, I think, we learned from the history is really how funny fundamental they are in human life today. They weren't so much in earlier times, but they are now. Mm. Earlier we talked about Louis the Fourteenth and how he pretty much governed from his bed. But in your book, you talk also about Winston Churchill and his relationship with the bed. That's magnificent. There is a vast volume, and it's heavy, and I lent it to a friend of mine, written by Field Marshal Allenbrook, who was... Winston Churchill's number two in running War Two, and there were magnificent descriptions. This is a rather dull book. It's amazing how much time they spent in meetings, but there were these amazing descriptions of Winston Churchill in bed. Churchill drove Alan Brock, who was a very organized man, absolutely crazy because he was unpredictable, he was temperamental, he was moody. He could be inspirational. He could reduce you to tears. But he did a lot of this in bed. And there are marvelous descriptions in this diary and in other things, other people too, of Churchill lying in his bed in a dressing gown, smoking a cigar, drinking scotch, and surrounded by papers. And he would ring a bell and his valet would come and his secretary would come and he would dictate. He ran a lot of the war lying in bed. He was a fairly nocturnal person in many ways. Yeah, it was a very, very important part of his life. And if you go to the war rooms, you can see the conditions under which he operated. And it's not surprising that with all the people rushing around, he spent time in his bed. We just have a couple minutes left, Brian, but I wanted to talk about uh, this idea of what uh, the beds of the future will look like and how technology uh, impacts, uh, you know, what we do in bed today. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what, what you've written about in your book? The thing that's fascinating about beds to me is that ultimately they are a platform upon which one lies down and sleeps. What they've done now is we've got to the point where the major research on beds is surrounds mattresses, memory foam, 
all the technological advances we can get to get this distant ideal of eight hours of undisturbed, peaceful sleep. I had a marvelous night last night. I slept for seven hours, which was lovely, but and it was partly due to my mattress. But what people are now doing is many people are turning their beds, if they have deep pockets, into cocoons, literally cubby holes into which you snuggle. You have a full media center. You may be connected to the web as you sleep or as you're going to sleep. You are never disconnected from the world. That to me is somewhat alien. I go to bed, maybe I'm old fashioned to sleep. And the other thing I love doing is lying in bed and just talking to my wife, having a conversation. And this is something, the art of conversation, except on the web is something we're kind of losing. And I think the bed really has a role to play there. But what's really happening is that we're more and more kind of getting into our cocoons surrounded by media and the web and video games <laughs> and Twitter and all that ghastly stuff. So we've really, I think, are losing something because the bed is a marvelous and social device for people to talk to each other face to face. Or if you want to have a bed and get people sitting on it, your children and so on, it's wonderful. And I oh. hope we never lose that. Or if you're a parent, sometimes it's great to hide in your bedroom from your children <laughs> to get a little Absolutely. work done, which is what I did uh, to prepare for this show. I want to thank my guest, uh, Brian Fagan, who co-authored a really interesting book, What We Did in Bed, A Horizontal History, joining us via Skype today. Uh, Brian, thank you for getting out of bed and talking with us. We appreciate it. Well, I'm now going back to bed, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet dreams. Uh, this is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by Lydia Brown. <laughs> We have a good we have a good time here on the show, and we want to let you know if you appreciate the wide variety of conversations on where we live, please support us. Here's a number to call: 